Okay, so I wanted to get started asking about the development of the film and what that process was like of really deciding to make the film overall and coming up with the idea and just getting the film together overall. Sure, sure. You want me to just take it from there? I can, I can just kind of give you the background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so well, so Jason and I are obsessed with science, technology, uh, and, and nature. And so, you know, we've done two other feature films in the past, one about Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, another one about these scientists in the Bay Area who want to make people live forever. You know, is that a good idea, a bad idea? So we're just, we're just naturally drawn to these questions around science and the future. Uh, and, um, you know, Jason had known about Stuart Brand since he was in college. And so we were curious, like, you know, you've seen the film, so there's just so much to know about that guy. We just wondered, <laughs> Who, who the heck is he and, and, and you know, what could be learned if we embedded ourselves in his life? Uh, and, and we're grateful to get the opportunity to do so. And also I wanted to ask about um, directing the film together and what that experience was like of really deciding how you would approach directing together and just your overall experience and once the project began in that sense as well. Yeah, do you want to answer that Jason? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, this is our, th this is, uh, our third indie feature that we've uh, we've directed together in addition to some television for higher projects uh, and and shorts and so uh, David and I over the last 10 years of after the founding of our, our company I guess 11 years now um, we've, we've developed a shorthand um, and we, we really do operate as a as a team um, you know David shoots uh, I do audio and we both direct and so um, you know it, I can't remember what famous Hollywood director said this, but a, uh, you know, a painter needs a canvas and some paints, that's it, but a, a film needs an army. And so um, it's always nice to have another part of your brain um, sort of outsourced to somebody else so that you can, you can kind of co-direct and actually make, um, make this thing come to life. I, I don't, most films are, you know, these Leviathan projects that take years to make and are you know it's like moving it's sisyphus moving a boulder up a mountain so having two people push the boulder up is uh easier than one i think it was orson wells who said that is it okay yeah i was i was googling around and i couldn't come up with it quickly <laughs> i could be wrong though you know it, it, those quotes are always attributed to everybody right <laughs> Also, I wanted to ask about what kind of research you might have done um, besides initially what you knew about um, Stuart and then delving deeper into his life and career and what that experience was like of really doing research um, into what his experiences um, had been like uh, overall as well. Yeah. yeah, I can take that one um, and then uh, you can fill in where I left off, David, sure. but you know, we're lucky. Stuart is one of the most uh, documented you know, sort of unknown people, like public figures who are kind of relatively not famous in the like 20th, 21st century where he has like four biographies or biographers who've written extensively about his life and his contributions. There's, um, you know, there's a wealth of material um, historians, environmental historians like Andrew Kirk and technology historians like Fred Turner. And, you know, and when we were making the film, there was another historian, uh, biographer John Markoff, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times journalist who are, are chronicling Stewart's adventures over the last 80 years. And so not every film subject comes with a bevy of historians who following in tow. And so we interviewed them for the film. We shot interviews with them and talked to them and their uh, advisors, but we never included them in the movie because we wanted this to be a firsthand account of Stuart and his life and not to have this detached historical perspective. And so, um, you know, we, we have in our, in our uh, bookshelf, just these, so many books as I look up like written about Stuart or about his projects. In addition to that, Stuart is a lifelong journaler. Uh, he wrote, he writes in his diary every day. And so he has donated those diaries to Stanford University where David and I went to grad school, a place that we are very familiar with. And so it was really great to just, you know, I spent one spring going down to Stanford every single day practically pouring over his diaries, what was going on. Not, I didn't read every one of his diaries, but I read like a lot of like what he was thinking about as a young man into his thirties and forties. So the research, I just don't know 
any like film subject that has the depth that we got to dive into. In addition to that, Stewart is a public figure. So there was all sorts of stuff from his merry prankster days uh, in the 60s counterculture, uh, environmental movement in the 1970s, the computer personal revolution in the 1980s. And then, you know, what he's doing now with the Long Now Foundation and Revive and Restore he has had so much media coverage. It it, it was just really, he made it easy on us because he's lived in public and has documented himself so well. Also speaking about um, having the accounts from people who know him and I wanted to ask about that experience of deciding who you would speak to and include in the film and securing those interviews as well for the film. Well, you know, uh, Stuart has, you know, a lot of the people we talked to were either friends of Stuart now or used to be friends with him and now disagree with him strongly about his views about, about his projects. And so, you know, I feel like it was rather easy to get people to come on on camera, um, I think without exception. But um, yeah, I mean, he's lived such an interesting life and has done so many things, you know, we could have interviewed a lot more people. So we had to be very selective about like, who we had time to include, uh, which was, which is, you know, it's not usually, you're not usually so lucky as a documentary filmmaker to have that kind of uh, uh, opportunity. And also I wanted to ask about um, deciding how you would visually shoot the film as well and working as the cinematographer and what that experience was like as well of just putting the visual aspects of the film together as well. Yeah, well, um, yeah, the, well, so we shoot Verite style, you know, meaning it's usually just me with a camera on my shoulder and then Jason has the audio set up. So we're a very small crew and we, we like that because we can really embed in people's lives and be um, not so uh, obstructive to their normal flow. Uh, but Stuart, you know, is both an intellectual where <laughs> most of the time you'll see him, he's just at his desk reading or writing. It's hard to make a movie about that, but you know, we're lucky that two of his projects today one, the clock of the long now, a 10,000 year long clock larger than the Statue of Liberty mm-hmm. uh, and, and built inside of the, the belly of a mountain. You know, it's a very visual thing. So we can go there and we can film it. We can look at it. We can think about what the purpose of that, that project is. And then uh, for his other project, the, the de-extinction project. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he went to Siberia, one of the most remote places of uh, parts of Siberia where there's this place called Pleistocene Park. I mean, there's a, there's a mug here, I have this Pleistocene Park, uh, where they plan to, uh, once they have the resurrected woolly mammoths, they plan to let them loose so that they can start to uh, tamp down the methane production happening there because of climate change. Um, you know, it's an incredibly visual place, you know, it's just, it's unlike anything else on, on earth. And so it's, um, you know, it was, it was easy once we got there and getting there was the hard part. Once we got there, it was easy to, you know, let the images kind of uh, soak in and, and we had a great deal of fun making that. And also speaking about the sound, I also wanted to ask about that experience as well and really syncing up the visuals with the sound overall and what that experience was like um, throughout production as well. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, as David said, we, we do, a ve- we, our approach is to try to keep it as observational as possible. So we want to, to have people live the life that they would normally be living irrespective of the cameras, but that's impossible. So, we, you know, we would gently, um, you know, we, we're not against uh, being provoking direction and telling people what to do. And so a lot of what we did was, was observational first. And as far as like syncing up the interviews um, with the visuals that that is really the handiwork of uh, of choosing what story we want to tell and what supporting materials we want to to use. But the idea would be to to leave it as you know observational as possible and only to have the interviews come in when it was uh, you know contextually necessary or emotionally evocative or we wanted to get something across. And so. Um, that that all all that magic happened in the in the edit room. And also speaking about the editing, I also wanted to ask about that process and figuring out what you wanted the final version of the film to look like, and just putting the final edit together as well. We work with our longtime collaborator uh, Anuka Lilia. She's um, a Finnish, uh, New York based editor who just you know we, it'd be hard to imagine. <laughs> doing these kind of projects without her because she's she's so 
uh, lyrical in her editing pace, but also really has an eye for the emotional aspects of the story. So it's not just about, you know, the science information. I mean, we do science films, you know, I could, I could see it being like a Nova where it's all explanation all the time, but she really helps us, you know, focus in on the human aspects of science, which in and, and a lot of ways are the most important aspects. I mean, science isn't done in a vacuum for the purposes of knowledge. It's done, you know, to make the world a better place for humans. Um, and so it's just, it's really useful for storytellers like us to have an editor on our side that can help focus on those things. And also, I wanted to ask about producing the film as well and what that experience was like for you both in balancing directing and producing as well overall. Yeah, what would you say? It's the only way we know how to do it, honestly. Uh, you know, we're not like, it's not like producers con, I mean, producers do contact us to make their movie for them or to bring on a director. But when you do these cradle to grave independent productions, the director is the producer, is the cinematographer, in David's case, is the audio person, in my case, we wear a lot of the hats. Um, of course, it does take a, an army. And so we have a, a team that helps us. But um, the producing, it feels, it feels very intimate. Uh, we're intimately involved in every detail of, of the budget and um, of, of where we're getting resources and how we're going to apply that and what we're going to film and how many days of production are we going to do. And, um, you know, the, it feels very uh, hand in glove. Um, I mean, there's problems with that too, because nobody says no to us because we are, we're asking ourselves. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it might be nice to have some separation of church and state. People can, you know, weigh, weigh in on whether or not we should be spending X amount of time or interviewing so-and-so or spending this much time in the edit room. But because we are, we are, we are our own bosses, we are our own producers, um, you know, we can dictate exactly the movie we want to make. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, producing is such a, uh, in our experience, a flaky term. It can mean anything. It, it can mean field production producer, or it can mean development producer or post producer. But in our case, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, making things happen and, um, you know, from cradle to grave. And so we were able to, 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 to make it happen, and uh, and and as directors, we get to decide that creative vision, and and as far as the business side, we also got to decide how it got done. Also, I wanted to ask about um, premiering the film at South by Southwest this year, and what that experience has been like of gearing up for the premiere as well. Well, we, well, we don't know yet, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, uh, today's our first press day. Uh, people have, you know, I think we last I checked, we did. Um, we had about 500 tickets reserved, so that's nice. But yeah, we really don't know how audiences have reacted to the film yet, and we're excited to, to hear from them, good and bad. I mean, our films sometimes polarize folks, uh, which is uh, you know always a good to have conversations uh, around what the films are, are about. Also, I'll just add that we had a kind of a rocky start just because of the pandemic. This film was supposed to premiere last South by Southwest, and you know, the world, we, we, we had just finished the audio mix the day that South by Southwest was canceled. It was also the day that, you know, I'm sorry, it was a week before the California lockdown and two weeks before basically the nationwide lockdown. So we, we, we've been in a whole year of hibernation. It's been an incredibly humbling and frustrating experience knowing that you built this film, but that it's can't be seen by people um and so this is going to be a great relief to have it out in the world and we, we were lucky enough that we were chosen um, you know a dozen or so films got to come back this year to south by southwest um and nobody has seen no public audience has seen this movie and um yeah i don't know it, it feels like we are um uh Oh God, what's the name of that that fairy tale where the guy takes a nap at the tree and then wakes up uh, later? Um, yes, exactly. I, yeah, Rip Van Winkle. We are we are. This is the filmic Rip Van Winkle. We've fallen asleep and then now we are we're woken up and the world has moved on. Is our film still is our film still relevant? What does it look like in 2021 after a pandemic? I mean, you know, we we put forth this movie about 
woolly mammoths and climate change and LSD. Who knows if that even makes sense in a 2020 world? <laughs> we think it's a timeless story that it will, but only only time will tell whether or not um, it's, it resonates with an audience. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a it's a weird it's a weird time to be releasing a movie, um, and we're really excited that South by gave us South by Southwest and Janet Pearson and the whole film programming team gave us another chance to to share it with uh, a, what we think is the perfect audience for this movie, the South by Southwest audience. Yeah, yeah, through the festival, or are you planning on maybe going to other virtual festivals, or just um, maybe what are your plans overall for officially releasing the film as well? Don't know. We, uh, yeah, I mean, the plan is to play it in uh, in, uh, in South by Southwest and screen it at um, a few other festivals like Hot Docs and um, Copenhagen and San Francisco, but we um, never have done a virtual festival. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I would really like to see it in the world. Uh, we, we would like to take it to drive-ins or, and hopefully it'll be at a real festival in a theater. And I, you know, I'd be so thrilled to do a real live Q and A and see the movie with actual people. Um, you know, it's one thing to go to a drive-in and look at the car next to you and mm -hmm. hope they're enjoying it. It's a very different thing to be sitting in the audience and hearing people chuckle and gasp and uh, be kind of moved and have a, an emotional journey. We were, we were robbed of that. Everybody was robbed of that. Um, not just us, but every film that came out and every audience that likes watching movies has been robbed of that. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I hope we can sell this movie and get it into homes as soon as possible and that the festivals that we go to are are uh it, enjoy it but it, it's it's not a substitute for the real thing okay i think that was actually it but thank you both again for taking the time out today i appreciate it thank you thanks a lot take care yeah, right. thanks you too bye-bye <laughs>